it was louder behind me because we are proclaiming what it is that we believe about Jesus Christ. And I hope that those words that you sung are words that you truly believe, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is worth giving our all to, that he truly did die on the cross and rise from the dead, and he rose with the conqueror to transform lives. And I know that he has done that with so many of you here. Well, uh, when I became the pastor of Woodbury Community Church back in 2008, I began my time here with two sermon series. The first series I preached was on the fruit of the Spirit, because I wanted us as a church to examine that fruit that Jesus wants to produce in the life of everyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ, and to examine and question, so what could God do if we truly lived our lives as, as people who were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and what God could do with people who were living lives like that? And then our second series was a series through the book of John where we took a look at the life of Christ and who it was that Jesus says that he is. And one of my greatest regrets as a pastor is that we only spent one week per chapter in the book of John, which means that we flew through that precious book and we just kind of scratched the surface about Jesus. See, one of the things about John is that in every chapter of John, there's at least one I am statement of Christ. And so you you read things like, I am the vine and you are the branches, or I am the good shepherd, or, um, you know, just statement after statement of Jesus and who he is. And uh, so we kind of focused on those statements, but we didn't go uh, much past that. And I wish if I had a do-over as pastor, we could go back through John's gospel and just, you know, give it the time that it deserved. And so as I was preparing for this year and talking with the staff and talking about our church and where is it that God's leading us to go in the year ahead, and where should we park in Scripture, Um, the theme of the life of Christ and and Jesus' teachings continued to come back again and again. And it got me thinking and praying and becoming uh, more and more convinced that we needed to spend time once again in the life of Christ, only this time we're going to do it as seen in the book of Luke. And so why Luke? Well, in a sense, um, we've already started the series. If you were with us for the month of December, we've been in Luke 1 and 2. We've taken a look at the original songs of Easter, Christmas, and, uh, and we've taken a look at uh, a little bit of Jesus' birth and the impact of his birth on at least four people, on Mary and on, on Zechariah and on the angels and on Simeon. Um, but there's so much more to Luke's gospel. Luke's Gospel is this incredible and unique book. It's unique in that it's the only book in the entire New Testament that is written by a Gentile. Luke himself was not an eyewitness to Christ, and so the book is not written from the perspective of one who walked with Christ and saw himself, the the teachings of Christ. It's written from a historian's perspective. Luke's Gospel contains more words than any other book in the New Testament. It is the most orderly account of the life of Christ ever written. When I was on staff at Wooddale Church, our senior pastor, Leith Anderson, did a Christmas series one year on the four Christmas Gospels. And it was an incredible series. He actually came dressed on stage as the characters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in four successive weeks. And you wouldn't recognize him. I worked with the guy, and he had makeup done, and one week he looked like a very old man when he did the part of John, and one week he he was kind of young and and enthusiastic as he talked about Mark's gospel. But I'll never forget when he talked about Luke's gospel, because the entire time he talked like this. He couldn't talk fast enough. He just wanted to talk a mile a minute. He was Luke, and Luke wanted to get as many words as he could in the gospel of Luke because that's what he was. He was a historian. He wanted people to know. And for 35 minutes or 30 minutes, Leith preached at that rate. It was an incredible thing for a guy who normally can't get through a couple sentences without coughing. I mean, it was just an incredible time. Some of you say, I preach fast, all right? And I do. I recognize that. But Luke was this guy in Scripture that wanted to get as much information crammed into his book as possible because he was a historian par excellence. His gospel was primarily written to a Gentile audience. In fact, it was written for a man named Theophilus, who we're going to talk about a little bit later. And it would have been read by skeptics and critics and true believers of the Christian faith all at once. As such, it has much to say about the culture in which we live today. Just a few more background pieces on Luke. Luke, by profession, was a physician. He was a doctor. 
He was a friend of the Apostle Paul, and we know that because Paul references him a few times. In fact, in Colossians 4.14, Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. So he was a good friend of Luke. I mean, he was a, 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 Luke was a good friend of Paul. He was educated in the Jewish religion. He was educated in science. He was educated in um, Greek, and uh, you're going to see that played out throughout his gospel. In fact, his gospel is written in the most formal Greek possible. So if you were a Greek scholar and you like to take the Greek New Testament and read the passages from Matthew and Mark and Luke and John in the Greek language, you would find a distinct difference between the way that Mark writes and the way that Luke writes. Mark writes more like he's writing a newspaper, and it's more the the Greek language of the day. And Luke, again, just this well-educated, classical Greek that he writes with, and it would have been eaten up by the cultural elite of the day. Leith Anderson gets some helpful perspective when he writes, because he lived nearly 2,000 years ago, we may not think much of his knowledge and skills compared to modern physicians, but that's really not fair. fair. While he did not know about bacteria or antibiotics or modern anesthesia or MRIs or CAT scans, he was not ignorant or unintelligent. Hypocrisy, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, and, uh, was the father of medicine, and he lived 500 years before Luke or the New Testament. His writings were used as textbooks in medical schools into the 19th century. Many of his observations about diseases and their treatments are still amazingly valid today. Doctors in the Roman Empire had, been, had to be keen observers of every detail of human experience because they could not rely on laboratory tests as physicians do today. In some ways, you could argue that they had to be brighter and better because of when and where they practiced their medicine. So Luke was a bright man. He wasn't just a historian and a doctor, but he was also a theologian and a musician. We've already looked at the musician part of him. I mean, he's this one who wants to record the original songs of Christmas. But some pastors and some scholars have said that Luke's gospel is this gospel of rejoicing. It is this gospel of music. When I think about rejoicing in the New Testament, there's one little tiny New Testament book that I think of more than anything else. In fact, if I think of joy in the entire Bible, the first book that comes to my mind is the book of Philippians. It's this little short book that the Apostle Paul wrote, and the word joy is all over Philippians. But you know what? The word rejoice is found in Luke's gospel more than anywhere else in all of Scripture. Luke's gospel is literally a gospel of rejoicing. He, he couldn't contain the joy that he, this Gentile man, had for the difference that Jesus Christ had made in his life. He wanted the world to know the joy that came from a relationship with Jesus. <coughs> and it is all over <coughs> Luke's gospel. He is um, a theologian as well. In fact, uh, this first century follower of Jesus who had been transformed by God wanted everyone to know about salvation. The word salvation is found in Luke's gospel more than any other gospel. In fact, it's like five times more than any other gospel. (coughs) The idea that salvation was for all who would believe in Jesus Christ and place their trust in him, whether they were Jew or Gentile, was central to everything that Luke believed. He believed that Jesus Christ had come for the world and he wanted the world to know who he was. So he took very seriously what he did. Well, earlier this week, my wife Cindy was starting a new devotional. Um, Like many of you, uh, her plan is to maybe read through the Bible this year, and she found a devotional from Nicky Gumbel, the vicar of Holy Trinity Church in Brompton in London and the pioneer of the Alpha Course. Many of you are familiar with Nicky because you've taken the Alpha Course and heard him teach at some point in your life. Well, in his New Year's Day devotional, Gumbel wrote the following. He said, I belong to a squash club that is also a gym. Each year on 1 January, I love the way the Britons say that, on 1 January, they bring in extra gym equipment. The place is packed out. By about 7 January, they move out all the extra equipment, as most people have given up on their New Year's resolution, and the club returns to normal. Get fit, lose weight, reduce drinking, stop smoking, get out of debt. There is nothing wrong with making these common New Year's resolutions. Of course, all of us make resolutions that we fail to keep. The good news is that each year is an opportunity for new beginnings and a fresh start. But so is each week. Every Sunday is the first day of the week, a new beginning. Actually, every day is an opportunity for a new beginning. 
The first three words in the Bible are in the beginning, Genesis 1.1. Each of the passages for today tells us something about new beginnings and new opportunities and suggests some possible New Year's resolutions. And so then he begins to talk about some New Year's resolutions that he said everybody who's a follower of Jesus ought to make these resolutions every year. And here's what they are. Number one, he says, we should make a resolution in our life to delight in the Bible. And he used the passage Psalm 1, 1 to 6 to focus on that. God's word is an incredible gift to us. And for many of us, it sits in our shelves every year. It uh, sits relatively untouched. We have more access than any generation before us to the word of God. We can have it in our cell phones and our our devices, and we can um, have it in any number of versions in print form. And so many of us fail to delight in the Bible. Second resolution is to focus on Jesus, that we would be a people who would focus in on who Christ was. And he used Matthew 1, 1 to 25 for that. And his third was to delight in God's creation, to enjoy God's creation, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 17. And I love those resolutions. And I hope that we will at least follow those two first resolutions this year as a church, that we as a church will delight in the Bible, specifically Luke's gospel, as we dive in verse by verse in exposition of its text. Secondly, I hope that you will focus on Jesus, which as we focus on Luke's gospel today, we're not going to be able to help but doing. And you know what? If you study Luke's gospel, you're also going to do number three. Because the scientist in Luke can't help but bring in much of God's creation to the story of Jesus. And you'll see that over the next several months. My grandpa used to tell me something, and I shared this when I preached through the book of John with you. He said, Brian, make much of Jesus in your life. I loved that. When I became a pastor, it's something I said that I want people to see in me. I want to be a pastor who makes much of Jesus. I want us to be a church that makes much of him. And that's what I want us to do over these next couple of years. I want us to make much of Jesus, to learn from Luke. I want to learn from the people that Luke lear- learned from. I want us to learn to love Jesus more, to understand him better, to allow his rule, his reign, his authority in our lives to spill out from us to the world around us, and all the more as we spend time with him. So without further ado, we're going to read Luke 1, 1 to 4. But before we do that, would you join me in prayer? Because it's important for us to go to the God of the Word before we go to the Word of God. So, Father, today, we thank you for the gift of Scripture. We thank you for Luke, this physician, historian, scientist, musician, theologian, who you have used in such incredible ways to write a gospel for people like most of us in this room, people who are Gentiles, who are benefactors of the, the, the blessing that comes from knowing Jesus and knowing him as our Savior and Lord. God, I pray that today as we read Luke 1, 1 to 4, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate us and teach us, God, that these words that I share today wouldn't just be my words, but that they would be your words, that, God, you would teach us today and help us to learn from this first century follower of Jesus who wrote under the inspiration of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's dive in. Inasmuch, Luke writes, as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word uh, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Now, if you paid attention as we read that, you're going to say, wow, that is one long run-on sentence because verses 1 to 4 of Luke are one sentence in the Greek. I love the way that the ESV translation of Scripture translates this. They're careful not to divide it into two, two, uh, two, two sentences, even though it might be easier to read that way. It's a little bit choppy. It's a little bit hard to read. Sometimes it doesn't flow out of the mouth real well. But that is who Luke was. When Luke wrote, again, he was this guy that wanted to pack in as much information as he could. He writes in this elegant Greek language. The sentences sometimes in English feel choppy, but this is an accurate translation of that. In the Luke 1, 1 to 4, there are four really important lessons for us that kind of set the stage for Luke's gospel that we need to learn this morning. And lesson number one is this, that Luke's gospel tells us about prophecy 
that has been fulfilled. That is essentially what verse 1 is teaching us. From the very beginning, Luke tells us that the words that he's recording in his gospel, which is essentially the biography of Jesus, are astonishing words. He's writing about prophecy that has been fulfilled or accomplished among them. In the NIV translation of Scripture, which reads a little bit easier, it says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have already been fulfilled among us. Luke believed that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. And his gospel would lay out a defense for that claim. And Luke wasn't the only one who believed this. In the time that Luke lived in the first century, all throughout the ancient Near East world, people were asking, could Jesus be the one of whom the Old Testament prophets spoke of? Now keep in mind that Luke's gospel came after Mark's gospel was written. In fact, most Scholars of Scripture will tell you that they believe that Mark was the first of the Gospels to be written. Again, Mark is written almost like a newspaper. It's written in this journalistic form. It's written by um, the, the nephew of Barnabas, probably a friend of Peter. Many people have said that Mark's Gospel could have easily been called the Gospel of Peter because Peter was most likely the source for uh, what Mark is talking about there hastily written. And in Mark's gospel, you continually see um, Jesus being this man of action. And he went here, and he went there, and then he went there, and then he did this, and then he did that. And it's just kind of everything that Jesus did. Matthew is who historians typically think of being the second gospel writer. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three books together, make up something that uh, those of you who've been in Bible studies or seminary or, or who, who've studied the Gospels know are called the Synoptic Gospels. There are a lot of similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so Luke wasn't the only one writing about Jesus at this time. Uh, lots of other biographies, but from the very beginning, Luke wants to make it clear in his Gospel that Jesus was the one who fulfilled the prophecies of old. Anderson writes, if he is correct, if his biography proves what he claims, there should be no doubt that Jesus is the supernatural son of God and that all he said was true. If his life is the fulfillment of prophecy, then God not only knows the future, but specifically foretold the future of Jesus. There are documented Old Testament prophecies about the birth, the life, and death of the Messiah. Some of them are so specific that they detail the place of birth and the manner of death Luke knew his readers would include highly educated skeptics who were not easy to convince. They would read and reread the evidence like scholars in a university or jurors in a juror room. So Luke's gospel speaks about prophecy that's been fulfilled. Secondly, Luke's gospel records the accounts of eyewitnesses. Look at verse 2. Just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It's one thing to say that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. It's an altogether different thing to verify that. Luke's gospel includes more eyewitnesses' accounts of the life of Christ than any other gospel. It's one of the things that makes his gospel different than Matthew, Mark, and John. Matthew and John were disciples of Jesus. They were there to see firsthand what was happening in Jesus' life. These were men who walked with Jesus. They traveled with him. They heard him teach. They saw firsthand the miracles of Jesus. John was at the cross and was an eyewitness to the cross. These men were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Most scholars believe, again, that the apostle Peter was the source for Mark's gospel. And so, again, you have this eyewitness account. But Luke wasn't an eyewitness to Jesus. He never even met Christ. In a sense, that's one of the spectacular things about Luke's biography. He had to interview hundreds, maybe thousands of people over a wide area to understand everything that he did about Jesus Christ. His travels would take him to cities where Jesus lived, cities where Jesus taught, cities where Jesus did ministry. He interviewed Mary, the mother of Jesus. He interviewed Jesus' disciples. He interviewed those who had experienced the miracles of Christ. It could be that he interviewed, again, thousands of people. And then he compared their testimonies. And do you know what? The testimonies were in agreement with each other. The historian, the researcher, the scholar, the physician that Luke was saw that the stories of Christ held up to scholarly research. So convinced were Jesus' followers that he was the promised Messiah who had been crucified, buried, and risen again that they were willing to give their lives up for Christ and for his message. 
All but one of the original disciples of Jesus became martyrs for their faith. Only John died as an old man. To a Greek world that was looking for answers, the research that Luke did in his gospel was a gift. Luke's gospel records the accounts of the eyewitnesses to Jesus, and that matters. His gospel shows us that our faith is rooted in history. The stories of Jesus aren't religious fairy tales. They are actual accounts that are verified by eyewitness testimony. Anderson writes, Christianity is now and has always been about the truth. History and documentation and eyewitness reports are the foundation of all that Christians believe. Eric Metaxas has become one of my favorite authors in recent years. He wrote that fantastic biography on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that was a bestseller a couple years ago. And this week he has been on the interview circuits on television show after television show because he has a new book out called Miracles. He is this winsome Christian author that people who are not believers pay attention to because like Luke, he is this scholarly historian. He was first a skeptic to Christianity. Metaxas was an atheist. And this week he was on the Today Show with Kathy Lee Gifford and Hoda. And um, they were interviewing him about his new book, Miracles. It's this book that asks the question, so does God still do miracles? Can miracles happen? And the historian that Metaxas is has interviewed all of these people who live today about verifiable miracles that they've experienced. And as he was being questioned on the Today Show, he just winsomely said, listen, he said, I'm a skeptic. And he says, I interviewed these people. These people have become friends of mine. These people, he says, they're telling the truth. And there are witnesses to the miracles that they've experienced in their lives. He says, God is still a God of miracles. And Kathy Lee and Hoda said, well, our world needs that today, don't we? We need a God who can do miracles. Well, yeah, we've always needed a, a God who can do miracles. Christianity is about verifiable truth. And the miracles that Luke is going to talk about in his gospel are miracles that were verified by eyewitness after eyewitness. Number three, Luke's gospel was meticulously researched. The NIV translates verse three this way, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now keep in mind that this, again, is just one sentence in Greek, so maybe the ESV translation is a little bit sharper here. But the idea that Luke is getting at here is that he has carefully investigated what he is writing. He's putting his name on his book as one who has done his homework. So who's this Theophilus guy? Well, we don't know much about him. The word Theophilus is really an incredible word. It's a word that even those of you who aren't Greek scholars may know what it means just by breaking it apart. It comes from two Greek words, and the first Greek word is the word theos. And the word theos means God. The word philos is the other Greek word that's used, and that's the word for love, one of the many Greek words for love, and it's the word that speaks about God's love. And so who is Theophilus? Well, his name literally means lover of God. Now, it's really an amazing thing. Historians over the years have debated whether or not Theophilus was truly the name of the guy that Luke wrote this gospel to. It could be that Theophilus was a code name. It could be that this was just a nickname that he had been given. Theophilus was this man who loved God, but that wasn't his actual name. Chuck Swindoll writes, Theophilus was probably a nickname of an Uh, of an actual person, such as a noteworthy Christian official who preferred to remain anonymous either for the sake of humility or for the need of safety. When you think about the time that Luke's gospel was written, Christians were being persecuted and being put to death in incredible numbers. And so this Theophilus may not have wanted his real name to be used. And so lover of God is the name that's used. It's most likely that Theophilus is the guy who underwrote Luke's expenses. He probably took care of Luke's journey to write the biography of Jesus. So Luke's gospel is in essence dedicated to this man, this benefactor who took care of his needs. It would be the first of two books that Luke would write for Theophilus. The other book was Acts. In fact, the students in our school of discipleship, which um, launches up again this Thursday, um, read Luke's books earlier this year. They read the book of Luke and they read the book of Acts. And one of their assignments was to take one of the passages from Luke or Acts and to come back to the school of discipleship. And they had to teach. They had to do a five-minute devotional in front of the entire class. And I was so proud of that group that day. They did a fantastic job. 
And I've told them that one or two of them are going to be preaching for me in the next year, all right? Luke's books are incredible. I believe that Luke meticulously researched his gospel because he believed that Jesus deserved the very best. The story of Jesus needed to be told right. Too much was at stake. The facts were so important. So from the very beginning of Luke's gospel, we see more detail presented than anywhere else. Luke's telling of the Christmas story is by far the favorite account of all the Christmas stories to people across countries. As many of you know, our family had a chance to get away this Christmas. We um, have never been away from here at Christmas time. It was never a plan of mine to be away from here at Christmas time. And Cindy's dad, for years, has been asking us if we would go on a cruise with uh, their family and, and Cindy's extended family, her sister and, and all of our nieces and nephews. And um, I've told him, no, every year, Dad, I've, I've got to preach. I, it's Christmas Eve. I can't get away. It's Christmas. And finally, Cindy said, Brian, we've got to say yes to my dad one of these years because we don't know how many more opportunities we're going to have to do this. And it's so important to him. And so we said yes this year. And it was an incredible experience as a family. And it was different. It was different to be away from here. It was different on Christmas Eve to be in the Cayman Islands. I know, suffering for Jesus, right? It was really a <laughs> difficult thing. We were opening bank accounts in the Caymans. No, not really. We, we went to Grand Cayman. And um, you know what? I, I love uh, going to different countries and being able to experience different things. Grand Cayman's a tiny little British colony and about 40,000 people that live in the island. And they have a premier who kind of is the leader of their government. And when I go to foreign countries, one of my favorite things to do is to go to a gas station. I know that might sound weird, but when I was in Russia years ago, I went to a gas station, and I found that you could get souvenirs at the gas station cheaper than anywhere else in all of Moscow, all right? And they were really cool. They had these books that my daughter still has to this day, these Disney books in, in Russian. And so we went to the gas station. I said, let's, let's check it out. And you can see the local candy, and you can see the local pot. Well, as we're there, we see the newspaper. And it was in English, and I decided to take a look at it because the front page caught my eye. It said, Premier's Christmas Message. And the premier of Grand Cayman had written on that Christmas Eve one of the most evangelistic messages I've ever seen in print. He became one of my favorite world leaders, this leader of a town that's smaller than Woodbury, all right? This is what he wrote, Pre Premier Alden McLaughlin. It's hard to believe that we've arrived at another season of Christmas, of love, giving, caring, and fellowship. It seems this wonderful season comes more quickly each year as I get older. But I do enjoy the time to slow down a bit, reflect, and give thanks. I also relish the opportunity to once again spend time and share with my fellow man. It was the great physician Luke in Acts 20, verse 35, who said, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus lived those words, and we would be wise to emulate him and remember him, especially at this time of year. Because really, that is what Christmas season is all about, celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is really the reason for the season. Luke tells of the advent of the Son of Man in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, a story that never grows old. And then he begins. Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all who inhabited the earth. And then, in the front page of the Cayman Courier, he kept Luke 1, 1 to 20 there. And then he says these words after, after the story. He writes, um, It was that babe, that infant, who ushered in God's forgiveness of our sins and who showed us through his short life grace, humility, forgiveness, love, kindness, and charity. I believe we have opportunities on a daily basis to be Christ-like and to show through our words and deeds love and charity to our fellow man on behalf of government, my family, and myself. I wish you each a very blessed Christmas season. Can you imagine seeing something like that in the United States? Can you imagine seeing, on behalf of government, I wish you all a happy Christmas. It's just an amazing, amazing story. The premiere of Grand Cayman calls Luke's story a story that never grows old. From the Charlie Brown Christmas special that includes Luke's gospel to greeting cards everywhere, Luke's words, words that were meticulously researched, show Jesus for who he is. Finally, Luke's gospel was written to build our faith. That you may have certainty, he writes in verse 4, concerning the things that you have been taught. 
Luke wanted Theophilus and all of his readers to be absolutely convinced that Jesus was God in the flesh, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior, that his gospel will bring us faith to face to face with the claims of Christ through the eyes and ears of those first century eyewitnesses who walked with Jesus. The historian wanted to give his Greek readers irrefutable proof that Jesus is God. And that is why we will take our time to go through Luke's gospel. We'll read along as young Jesus baffles religious leaders. We'll watch as John the Baptist prepares the way for Christ. We'll watch Jesus and be eyewitnesses many years away to the miracles of Christ. We'll sit at the feet of Jesus and listen as he teaches in parables, teaches these lessons that oftentimes require us to take a deeper look at the spiritual truth that Jesus is teaching in the form of a story. We'll walk with him in that crescendo moment in Luke's gospel as Jesus studies himself to go to Jerusalem, to die on a cross for our sins, to be buried, and then we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And I hope through it all, you will continually ask the question, so who is Jesus? Is Jesus who I've assumed him to be my whole life? Is Jesus the one that I was taught about in Sunday school? Have I forgotten maybe some of what Jesus said? And I hope we'll look with fresh eyes at the one that we come to worship week after week. Many of you know one of my favorite pastimes is looking at art. It's one of the reasons I love Gloria Popowitz so much. I uh, was preparing my message and, um, on Facebook yesterday because that's how I roll, all right? And so and throughout the day, uh, Gloria was posting these updates of the art that she was working on that's hanging on these walls today, and it's beautiful. I know that Gloria was here early this morning hanging this because I was finishing my sermon early this morning as she was hanging, and so we had this conversation going on last night, and I love that art. And I, I'm also somebody who's been known to spend time at art museums, and I love to go to places like Goodwill and Savers and rescue art that others have thrown away. I love the church garage sale and seeing the art that comes in there every year, and um, I, just, I just love art. And when we were on the cruise ship this past week, uh, many of you who have been on cruises know that uh, most cruise ships have some kind of art gallery that's on board, and there's art all over the walls, and the Park West galleries out of Southfield, Michigan, run many of those, many of those uh, art auctions. And it's not the highest quality art in the world, but it's art. And they have some classes on art, and they have auctions for the art. And I, I just had a blast. I went to everything that was offered for art. And so I went to all the classes. I went to the auctions. I found ways to make it down to the gallery and visit it. I would make excuses to walk back into the gallery and see art. I tried my best to get Cindy to bid on art that we couldn't afford. I mean, I love art. And as such, I got to know all of the staff of the Park West Galleries on that Carnival Freedom cruise ship. And uh, a couple of them were from Bucharest, Romania. And I've been to Romania in the past, and, uh, and so that was an area of interest for me. One of them was from Budapest, Hungary, and I was there as a college student. One of them was from Ontario, Canada, and I've been there. And so I had all these little opportunities to talk with the staff and get to know them. And one of the staff from Bucharest was a guy named Ronnie. And on Christmas Eve night, Ronnie um, was tasked with the unenviable uh, deal of teaching a class on Thomas Kincaid. And I say unenviable because he'd never done it before. And the guy who was in charge of that didn't want to spend his Christmas Eve doing a 25-minute lecture on Kincaid. And so Ronnie did it, and there were five of us that showed up for his lecture that night. I was one of the, the five on Christmas Eve sitting there listening to Ronnie teach. I was the only American. There were a bunch of Asian tourists who were buying art, me and, uh, and somebody from Canada. And so um, the five of us are listening to his lecture on Kincaid. And at one point, uh, Ronnie, uh, toward the end of the presentation talked about one of Kincaid's most famous paintings, a painting called Sunrise that is on the screen right now. It's this painting many of you have seen. Maybe some of you have a print of this in your home. It's uh, the cross on the top of a mountain. And Ronnie said something interesting. He said, I'm not a religious man, but something about this painting stirs me inside. And I just find myself staring at this painting more than any other in our gallery. He says, I know there's thousands of this print around the country. It's not the most valuable print, but there's just something about this painting. 
And it's Christmas Eve, and I'm a pastor, and I said, okay, God, I guess I better talk to Ronnie. And so afterwards I said, hey, Ronnie, I said, why aren't you a religious man? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, of all people, you ought to be religious. And he says, well, why do you say that? I said, because the guy who died on that cross has transformed Romania. And he's turned your country around. The church in Romania is the reason that the revolution came. It was the church in Romania that took a stand, and it was the church of Jesus Christ that said that you know, we, we, want, we, we, we want Christ to shine in our nation. No longer do we want to be oppressed and not be able to share the news of Jesus. And I said, what happened in your country helped begin a revolution that changed the entire, uh, entirety of Eastern Europe. He says, because of what happened in Romania, the Iron Curtain fell down. And he says, you know, I never thought of it that way. He says, well, why, how do you know so much about Romania? I said, well, I've been to your country. And, and I said, and there was a pastor in your country that transformed my life, a guy named Joseph Tan. And I told him about Joseph, this pastor who I've told you about before, was speaking at my college when I was, felt the Holy Spirit call me into ministry because of this Romanian pastor and his challenge to us about have we really trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord? And Ronnie and I talked for about 45 minutes that night. He shared with me his life. He actually told me that his parents worked for Nicolae Ceausescu. Ch- 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 I can't say it today. Nicolae Ceausescu. And he talked about um, what it was like to grow up as one of the kind of ruling families in this oppressive society. His parents were actually diplomats in Libya for the man, a man who persecuted Joseph and Joseph's family. It was this incredible time that we had to share. And Ronnie, he didn't become a follower of Jesus Christ. But he began to consider some of the claims. That the man who died in that cross is a man who changed this world. In 1926, Dr. James Francis preached a message that included a summary of the life of Christ. It's called One Solitary Life. Some of you have heard this before. Here's a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place that he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen and now twenty long centuries have come and gone. And today he is the centerpiece of the human race and leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Luke's gospel forces us to ask, who is this man? We need to ask, who is this man about Jesus Christ? His biography is worth studying. It was written so that we might have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught. So let me encourage you in 2015 to take your Bible off the shelf. And let's pay attention together at Luke's Gospel and discover together who is this man. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. And so, Holy Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that in your goodness and in your sovereignty, that in your love for humanity, you saw fit to inspire a Gentile writer named Luke to write an orderly account about Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Lord, I thank you for the hundreds, if not thousands, of eyewitnesses who shared with Luke the information that he would include. And I thank you for your Holy Spirit that inspired Luke to include the words that he did in Scripture. God, may we as your children be people who continue to glorify and reflect you in the culture around us. Give us the courage to walk with you in our generation. and Give us the desire in 2015 to be people who would um, 
Lord, just delight in your word, that we would be people who would look deep into who Jesus Christ is, that we would enjoy your creation. God, that we as a church would be people who honor you by making more disciples for Jesus Christ and that we would do so by loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbors, ourselves, and making disciples as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.